Good morning, church. All right, you all may be seated. Um, I've seen a lot of new faces over the last few weeks, so I just wanted to mention our Church Center app. Um, there is a QR code on the front of your bulletin, and it's toward the bottom, and it says, let's get connected. Um, if you scan that QR code, it'll take you directly to the Church Center app to download. Uh, that, it, that app is one way that we can communicate all the events that are coming, um, that are coming up. So if you haven't done so yet, uh, make sure to scan that QR code so you can get connected with us. Um, I do have a few announcements for this week. Uh, the first one is that Love Out Loud is hosting a winter coat drive from now all through February. 
Um, so if you'd like to donate, uh, we ask that you bring in a new or used coat in good condition. Uh, you can drop it off at the front doorway. Um, as you walked in uh, to your left, there are some coats on the rack. You can just put it over there. Um, and if you need a coat, you are welcome to help yourself as well. Then on November 15th, we have Food on the Move. It happens every third Friday of the month from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So if you or someone you know uh, needs some food assistance, uh, you're welcome to join us then. And then in the back of the room, we have a cardboard box over by Love Out Loud. Um, we are participating in Toys for Tots. So if you'd also like to donate a toy, we ask that you bring in a new and unwrapped toy um, and place it in the cardboard box in the back by Love Out Loud. And then next Sunday is a really fun Sunday. It is flannel and flapjack Sunday. So after church, you might want to sort through your closet and find your, your favorite flannel um, and make sure to wear it next Sunday. And we'll also be serving some flapjacks for us to chow down. So that'll be a very fun Sunday uh, to attend. And then just for you to save the date on December 4th, at 6 p.m., we are having a church-wide Christmas party. Um, you all are invited to attend. There is another QR code. Uh, there's a QR code on the back of your bulletin. If you'd like to sign up to bring something, whether it's cookies, salad, or if you'd like to purchase some uh, Casey's gift cards to buy some pizza, um, yeah, we ask that you sign up to just bring something if you desire to. All right, so that is all I have for announcements. Uh, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord up in heaven, uh, thank you so much for all these exciting events that we have coming up in our church, Lord. God, um, thank you for these opportunities for us to fellowship with each other, Lord, to praise you, to serve you, God. Um, I just pray that you give Pastor Robert the words to speak, uh, that he speaks your words, God, that you prepare our hearts and our minds as we worship you, God. God, please help put all of our attention on you today, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I wanted to share with you all something uh, about a week and a half ago as I was trying to finalize the songs for this Sunday there was one song that I just could not nothing was was fitting and it's this next song we're gonna sing so I just said God you're gonna have to help me here I'm struggling what song do you want so I opened my phone and started looking through all our songs that we sing and I stopped on house of the Lord and, you know, there's joy in the house of the Lord. And I thought, ooh, well, it's the Sunday after the election. And some people, no matter what, there's going to be people who are not happy. There's going to be people happy. Maybe people who are both happy and sad. But you know what? Our joy is not dependent on any circumstance. Our joy is not dependent on what happens in the flesh. Our joy is not dependent on who is president or who isn't president. Our joy is not dependent on an amendment that passed or didn't pass. Our joy comes from the Lord, and he is where the joy is. So this morning, we're going to fill this room with praise and worship. And uh, so please get to your feet, choir. You're the choir. We're just the choir directors. So we expect you to sing. <laughs> but, we expect you to praise. Yes. <laughs> We're going to worship because there is joy in the house of the Lord this morning, today. Yes. 
worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Because he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave, my God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your Got one very important detail in that story. <laughs> I heard God say to me, and it wasn't audible, but he spoke to my spirit, and he said, when I questioned him, he said, trust me. And I was like, yes, Lord, I'm going to trust you in this. So we need to remember to trust God in every circumstance as well and listen to him. <coughs> Be magnified. 
Why is it that sometimes the innocent, the most innocent among us, their lives are snuffed out early, while the wicked just seem to live on and on? It's a difficult question to answer. I'm going to do my best to try to do so this morning. As I take you through a whirlwind tour of Second Samuel, some of the events that take place in there. We're going to start in chapter 12 starting halfway through verse 15. To give you some background information, this is after David's adulterous affair with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Uriah was a great warrior, and David had an affair with his wife. Bathsheba got pregnant, and he tried to cover it up. Uriah was home on holiday. He tried to set it up so they would spend a night together, so... You know, the timing wouldn't quite match up, but still he could conceal it. But Uriah, Uriah had other plans. He refused to go home while his men were not allowed the same luxury. And so David concocted a scheme. He put Uriah on the front line, the most dangerous part of the battlefield, and ordered his generals to fall back, abandoning Uriah to the most valiant of enemy men. And sure enough, Uriah fell there. He died. The prophet Nathan confronted David about this. He told him of the bad things that would be happening to him and his house. And let me start here down in verse 15, halfway through. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, The child is dead, he may do himself some harm? But... When David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servants said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. David had peace in the even in the midst of this disaster. His child was with him no more. But he knows where the child is going, and he knows where he's going. As it is written in Psalm 17, verse 15, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. 
David knows that one day he's going to be at God's side, and he knows that when that day comes, his child will be right there with him. I'm not going to say it's an easy thing, because it's not. It hurts. Because that child that's supposed to be there is not there. There's a big hole where they should be. But we can have confidence knowing that they're not in pain. They're in paradise. And when that eternity comes and we go to God's side, we can have confidence that that child will be right there with us. To further illustrate this point, we're going to shift over to another of David's children, Absalom. Part of the disaster that was decreed was that someone was going to lay with David's wives in the sight of the sun. And that someone would be his very flesh and blood, his son Absalom, who rebelled. He gathered up an army, and David was forced to flee. He was David's bitter enemy, and yet David instructed his men to go easy on Absalom for his sake. But that's not how it worked out. In the end, Absalom would be riding through a forest. And he would get caught up in a tree. And David's men would strike him down. And here is what David's reaction is when he hears the news. This is, verse eight, this is chapter 18, verse 33 of Second Samuel. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Absalom died an enemy of God, and an enemy that, despite everything, David wept over him. When we die, our choice is locked in, as it were. If we don't know who Jesus is, if Jesus isn't our Lord and Savior, then there's no chance for redemption anymore. Only eternal separation from God. And so, if you can wonder why the innocents fall early while the wicked live on, God's being patient with them. He wants them to turn back. It's not in God's will that anyone should perish, but all should come to eternal life. Nevertheless, there will be those that refuse God's mercy, and that is a very sad thing indeed. But we can have hope, and we can have confidence that no matter how bad someone's sins may be, the blood of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is greater. No matter how far from God they may seem, we know that God really isn't that far. He is just waiting for them to turn back. They might have eternal life as well, and that's why we're here. We're here because God makes his appeal through us. The hands, the feet, the mouth, the heart of Jesus. We're the body of Christ. No matter how flawed we may be, even in our weakness, God's able to use us. God has his work set out for us, for us to do. And we can celebrate that there is redemption possible. We can celebrate that God has redeemed us, that even when we were his enemy, he died for us, and he made us right with him. He did that through the sacrifice of his precious son, Jesus Christ, through his death, his suffering, his death, and on the third day, his resurrection. This bread is Jesus' body, broken on the cross on our behalf. If you have it ready, take it with me. This cup is Jesus' blood shed on the cross on our behalf so that our sins might be forgiven. If you have it ready, take it with me. Now let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you're in control. We know that you're going to work things for our good. And we also know that you have work for us to do. Use us to make your appeal, Lord, to the Absaloms of the world so that they might come back to you and they may not be lost forever. Move your Holy Spirit in our midst, O oh Lord. Give us the words to say. Give us the patience to deal with the people who can be very difficult. 
and give us the confidence to know that you're always with us, even in the midst of the loudest storm, even in the deepest valley. Help us to remember that you're there always, and we won't ever be apart from you ever again. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. As we approach another divisive and contentious election season in our country, the debate and divide between left and right continues to grow. Battle lines are clearly drawn. The us versus them mentality is at an all time high. For followers of Jesus, how are we to engage in the politics of our earthly kingdom without abandoning our purpose in God's kingdom? How can we be proud of our country without putting our faith in it and its systems? How can we be patriotic without being partisan? Can we? Jesus and the writers of the scriptures seem to think so. But in order for us to do these things, we must get beyond left and right and start living a better way. We must start living with a kingdom agenda. All right, good morning, church. Welcome to the final week of our series, Kingdom Politics. The goal of this series is to stay rooted in Scripture, to refocus the church, and to represent the truth in culture. And as we wrap up this series, I want to talk about a few things that I've noticed and learned through this process. As I've said every week, uh, I'm not a very political person. But I have spent a great deal of time over the last several months reading and listening and learning about politics. And in that time, I've noticed something. Oh, our culture devalues and demonizes truth. I can't tell you the number of people that I've listened to and interacted with who simply believe something that someone told them without ever doing the work to verify if it was true. And Acts 17, verse 10 and 11 teaches us an important lesson about this. It says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than all of those in Thessalonica. And they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were were so. Now obviously these verses apply specifically to the instruction and the study of scripture, but I think they can also teach us a broader lesson about being people of truth. As born again believers, we should be people who are known as people who speak the truth and believe the truth. It's actually one of the core values we have as a church, standing in truth. We're going to live our lives, lead our families, and guide our church under the direction of God's word. In everything we do, we seek to follow God's way. And the Bible is our supreme infallible source of truth for Christian beliefs and living. We will stay biblically focused but culturally relevant as a church because we are people of the word and for the word. Our culture, unfortunately, does not value truth. We live in a culture that thinks truth is subjective. I have a truth and you have a truth. There is no common standard of truth in our culture today. And that is a lie. There is one standard of truth, which is the Word of God. Far too often we elevate our feelings and our opinions to the level of truth which distracts us and those around us who we interact with from our primary message. Jesus knew this was going to be a problem for us, which is why he prayed specifically about this in John 17. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open there. We're going to cover much of this passage today. I'm not going to read all of it, but I will read a, a quite a large amount of this text. It says this beginning in verse 1, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, 
Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth having accomplished the work that you have given to me. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. This first part of the prayer, Jesus is focusing on God's glory. Jesus glorified God on earth, and now Jesus is asking to be restored to his former glory in heaven. And then he shifts his focus. Focusing specifically on his disciples, which includes you and I if you are a born again believer. Because Jesus knows that salvation of the world depends on the witness of those whom the Father has given him out of the world. And we all need his intercession in order to do what he has called us to do. Jesus continues praying. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you have given me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you have sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those that you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given to me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction, that Scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things that I speak into the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that, they take, that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. For they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Let me ask you this question. How much does the world hate you? That might seem like an odd question, but Jesus says, because of the word that he has given to us, that we have written today in our Bible, because of this, The world will hate us. But I've seen a lot in this election season. It's born again believers who hate the ones, the very people that we are called to love. Before the actual election, I saw a lot of hate from those who oppose God's word. A lot of hate from the idea of prayer. A lot of hate towards those who want to protect the lives of unborn babies. But after the election... After the election, I saw quite a lot of hate from believers who sought to brag and boast about their party or even personal victory. This election cycle has shown me that as we as born-again believers need to stop and think about the lives that we have believed on the left and on the right. We need to actually open up our Bible and read it. For ourselves, listen to what Jesus prayed. Sanctify them in the truth. CNN and Fox News is the truth. That's not what it says. Hang on. It says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified in the truth. And I do not ask for these only, but also those who believe in the platform of the Republican Party. That's not it either. Hang on. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me, Jesus Christ, through their word. That they may be one just as you Father are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so the world may believe that the Democratic Party is the solution to the world's problems. 
still not right. Hang on. That the world may believe that you have sent me. That the glory you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you loved me. Now you might laugh and think that's funny, but the truth is, many of you in this room, many of you who are watching online have said as much. You've been the Pied Piper for your party. And you've hurt the witness of Christ as a result. The election is over, and like it or not, we are stuck with the results. Maybe it's time we actually reflect on what is really important. Maybe we take some time to assess our priorities and see what our focus should be on because we have got a lot of work to do. Win or lose, we are all called as born-again believers to be kingdom citizens who are called to do kingdom work. We've got a lot to do on this side of the election if we are going to actually live out the kingdom principles and values that we just voted for. So let's look at those five kingdom principles we've been talking about the last several weeks. Religious liberty, border security, biological sex, family and life. Now that the election is over, how are we as kingdom citizens to advance the idea of religious liberty in our community? Well, here are some ideas. Pray about it. Prayer is the most powerful way to advance the kingdom in our community, so commit to praying for our leaders, for our community, and for opportunities to share the truth of who Jesus Christ is to those around you. Change the conversation. Rather than trying to score points on social media or win an argument, change the conversation and maybe actually start sharing your faith. We talked a lot about how Jesus, if you talked as much about how Jesus loves you and what he's done in your life as you did about the latest conspiracy theory, or you shared God's word as much as you shared misinformation that you heard on the news, our community and our country would be a far better place. See, the change that both sides want to see in our world is better schools and caring for those who are less fortunate, a better economy, and all of that happens only when we pursue Christ rather than political policies. What about border security? How can we as kingdom citizens seek to live out the kingdom value that we see when it comes to the border? Here are some ideas. Support ministries who serve immigrants. Like I said a few weeks ago, we as born-again believers are called to love immigrants in our community. And a great way to do that is to support ministries who love and work and share the gospel with immigrants in our country. Did you know that one of our missions partners, Eric and Melissa Davis from Pioneer Bible Translators, actually works with refugees and immigrants in the city of St. Louis. So every time that you give to our church, you are actually helping to share the gospel and meet the needs of immigrants in our state. Another way you can do that is to end trafficking, working to end trafficking. A big problem in connection with the border is human trafficking. There's a great Christian organization called A21 that works to educate and help those who are enslaved through trafficking. I didn't know this, but as I was preparing for this message, I found out that right now there are more people enslaved today than at any point in history. And it's time we as the church should be doing something about it. So if you want to learn how to get involved, you can visit A21.org and find out how to help. What about biological sex? How are we as kingdom citizens seeking to live out the kingdom values when it comes to biological sex? Well, here's an idea. Support mental health help. Mental health and counseling are stigmatized in our community. A lot of that has to do with the way that we talk about those things. Too many people I've heard in our community and this church downplaying and criticizing those who are struggling with mental health. 
If you want to help those who are struggling with gender dysphoria or a gender identity, then they cannot be the punchlines to our jokes. Mental health is an epidemic in our country, and we are furthering the problem by pretending like it's not even there. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, then we as a church want to give you the resources, the support to help you as you deal with those things. How can we promote the kingdom values of marriage and family in our community? Well, here are some ideas. Support families who are in need. There are many families who are struggling in our community today, especially during the Christmas season. And one of the ways that you can help those families is by helping provide toys for Christmas this year through our Toys for Tot partnership. There's more information about that by the Love Out Loud board. Or you can help by purchasing food items for our food pantry. Next week, we're going to release a holiday season-specific list of food that we need to give out through Love Out Loud this season, specific items to help families as we move into a holiday season. Another way that you can make marriage and family a priority is to make your family a priority. It's far too easy in our busy lives to make our families play second or third chair to our schedule. If you're wanting to change the culture around you, then it starts at home. So the question you have to ask is, when was the last time you dated your spouse? How often do you eat meals together as a family? How much time do you spend together doing things you enjoy rather than rushing from one thing to the next? If all the time you spend with your kids is dashboard time, that's a problem. So your family is your first ministry. Now that the election is over, how are we as kingdom citizens to advance the value of life in our community? With the passing of Amendment 3, we as born-again believers have a lot of work to do. The last several weeks in our house, we've talked a lot about the the election and our responsibility as godly citizens in a kingdom and in a nation. We've had a lot of conversations about Amendment 3. And unlike many of the people I've talked to about it, we've actually done the research. We've talked to lawyers and lawmakers and doctors about what this amendment would mean if it were to pass. And in our conversations one day, Tyler said this abortion law reminded him of a story in the Bible. Praise God for our family ministry for teaching my kids this story. Let me read it to you. It's found in Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, continuing in verse 16 and 18. It says, now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Herod, when he had saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all of the male children in Bethlehem and all the region who were two years old or younger, according to the time that he had discerned from the wise men. This was fulfilled what is spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel is weeping for her children, and she refuses to be comforted, for they are no more. And you know he's right. Weeping and loud lamentation is heard throughout our state because of the lies and manipulation of evil, demonic leaders who want to murder children. The passing of Amendment 3 is an abomination on our state. And when we had the conversation with our kids about Amendment 3 passing and what that meant, my son Kai said, will they put babies in baskets and float them down the Missouri River? Because Pharaoh wanted to hurt babies too, and that's what Moses' mom did. And that cut me to the core. Because I couldn't answer the question. But as I thought about it more and more, the more I realized that putting babies in baskets was the exact thing we needed to do. We need to be the baskets, church. The time has passed 
on us stopping this evil. The time has begun for us to fight it. It's time to stand up and support ministries like Birthright and the Pregnancy Option Center of Warren County. It's time to be the baskets for these babies. We are the baskets for these babies when we help moms facing unexpected pregnancy. We are the baskets for these babies when we give diapers and wipes to moms who need it. We are the baskets for these babies when we help with food and formula for families who are hungry. We are the basket for these babies when we stand up and speak the truth to a culture that believes the lies. We are the baskets for these babies when we pray and when we march and when we resist and when we fight against against this evil of child sacrifice that is accepted, allowed, and acted out across our country. And the question you have to ask yourself is, are you going to actually live out what the Bible says, or are we just going to talk about it? Because if you're ready to stop talking and start doing something, then I'm going to invite you today as we continue in worship to come and kneel at this altar, because the change happens when we pray. But it's time we stop talking about God's word and not doing God's word. It's time we give, stop giving lip service and start giving foot service to what God has called us to do. If we're going to actually promote religious liberty in our community, then it's time we actually stand up and start speaking the truth to our community. It's time we actually start sharing our faith with those around us that we know are dying and going to hell. If we say we care so much about the border, it's time we start loving people who are in our country who look different than us, who act different than us, who speak different than us, who believe different than us. If we actually say we care about biological sex and we want to fight against this transgender ideology, then it's time we actually start living out what God's word says about it. If we care so much about biblical marriage and the family, it's time our families stop being treated like hell. If we say that we believe life begins at the point of conception, if we are called to defend the unborn, the born from death, from womb to tomb, then it's time we actually start doing something about it. The time has come to stop talking about it and to start doing something about it. Evil will not stop itself. It has to be stopped. And if we say we love Jesus and we believe everything in this book, which I do, then it's time we start doing something about it. Because I'll tell you, this election... It's not the hope our country needs. Donald Trump is not the savior that our country needs. Jesus Christ is. And it's time we actually start doing what we say we believe. Because talking about it and voting for it is not enough. This election is going to change a lot of things in our country But it's not going to change the evil that is continuing to influence, direct, and perpetrate on the lives of our kids. It's time we stand up. It's time we do something about it. So I'm going to ask you as we continue in worship today, if you're tired of just talking about it and you're ready to start doing something, to come to the front, to kneel at this altar, and to ask God to move, to ask God to intervene, to ask God to be the baskets that these babies need in our state. To take one of these baby bottles and fill it up with change so that we can continue to fight against the evil that is in our land. To go out and share your faith with your neighbor. To go out and love people well. It does no good to live in a country where we can come and worship together and say we love Jesus, and then leave these doors and do nothing about it. We've got to stop it. We've got to start doing things. We've got to start living the faith that we say we believe. We've got to stand up. This will not stop with our state. It will continue to move throughout our communities, throughout our schools, throughout our states and throughout our nation. If godly, born-again believers do not stand up and do something about it,
personal to me. When I have to look at my son who's asking if he could have been one of, one of those babies. He could have been. And there's going to be many more if we don't step up and do what God is calling us to do. We've got to be people of the word, but not just people who read the word, not just people who speak the word, people who live the word. That's what I'm asking you, church. I'm asking you to step up and live what you say you believe. God, I'm grateful for this country. And it's broken and flawed. But I'm grateful to live in a place where we can come and gather and worship you. There are so many people around the world who can't even own a Bible without being persecuted and killed. God, forgive us for the apathy. Forgive us for being disingenuous with our words. Help us to have boldness to stand and speak truth to the lies, to stand up with faith and do what you have called us to do as your people, to be a light in dark places, to meet the needs of those around us, to help people who are suffering and hurting, to be a light for people who are in darkness, to surround people with your love. God, I pray that you prick our hearts, that you convict us of our lack of action today. God, I ask for boldness, that we won't just sit on the sidelines and talk about what your word says, but we will actually go and live it. That we'll be the baskets for these kids who need us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. stand and join us as we continue. My children, listen.
for your hope must be in me. And not in man. For I am not a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian. For I am God of the universe. Look to me. And I will bring you the answers you need. Look into my word for it is truth. For I shared my love with you when I created you. You are my masterpiece. I made you in my image. I showed you my love when I sent my son. For he bore your sins upon the cross and uttered not a word. And he rose again on the third day. And he is seated at my right hand. Seek me and you will find me. Knock and it will be open. For you are my vessels. Before the foundation of the world. I have set you apart to do good works, but I will not force you. It is your choice. Look to me, and I will make straight your paths. Father, we praise you for your love and your mercy, for your word that is true. Father, we submit ourselves to you. We humble ourselves before you. Father, we ask for you to move in our lives, Father, as we surrender our own will to your own. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory enthroned on the highest praise you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory enthroned on the highest praise you sent the darkness running out of an empty now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone.
when you give to our church each week, you give to kingdom work. Whether that's what happens here in this building, what happens through our food pantry, through Love Out Loud, or globally around the world through our missions partners, you give to these kingdom principles. And that matters. And so as the blue buckets come around, if you've already given this week, thank you for your offering. You can give in the buckets. You can give through the Church Center app. You can give online at highhillchristianchurch.org forward slash give. And you can give by mailing a check to 852 Boons Lake Road, High Hill, Missouri, 63350. The really cool thing about God, there's lots of them, but one of my favorite things about God is when you have no idea that he's been working until you see it and then that light bulb goes off. God is in this place. And if you don't know this, um, Robert is really intentional with planning out our um, series calendar. And as he's praying and, and figuring out what God is wanting our church to hear, it's set in advance, but sometimes God shows up and he, and he changes it. And so this series was supposed to be a, a five-week series, and it ended up being a four-week series. And the amazing thing about it is today is Orphan Sunday. And so if you don't know what Orphan Sunday is, it is a Sunday where the, the church globally, the Big C Church, comes together, and they support the work of foster care, adoption, pro-life organizations to make sure that kids are taken care of through the church. And had this series gone one more week, we wouldn't have ended on this incredible day. And so um, after Dee spoke and Robert and my really smart children spoke, now I get to get up here and ramble to you. But what we're doing today to celebrate Orphan Sunday is we have these little books. And if you don't know, Wendy's, the restaurant, um, does a lot of work with foster care. And foster care is obviously very dear um, to my heart. But my family was at Wendy's probably six or eight weeks ago. And there's this mural on the wall in this Wendy's that we were at. And it's like a french fry and a burger. And they're holding hands and they have a little baby Frosty in the middle and my kids thought that was the coolest artwork that they had ever seen because it was a family and it was funny because they didn't look alike and they thought it was amazing because our family doesn't look alike either and so they thought it was funny that a burger and a fry would have a baby milkshake and I mean that is funny right but it makes a whole complete family and we were talking while we were eating um, about our church and how that's how our church looks too we don't all look alike we all come from very different places and yet we come together and we are one family and while we were there um, Wendy's was selling these really cool books and it's so funny because they are books that give you free Frosties, which is what the little baby on the picture was. Um, but if you bought these for a dollar, everything that Wendy's made off of these books goes to help kids in foster care and adoption. And so my kids said, let's buy one. And I was like, okay. And then they said, for everyone in the church. And we were like, oh, <laughs> that's a lot of Frosties. <laughs> we should have let them finish their sentence before we agreed. And so, what we did to celebrate Orphan Sunday is everybody gets a book of Frosties. And so when your family is enjoying your Frosties, all of the money that our church donated for these is for kids in foster care. A way to celebrate Orphan Sunday, to love kids that we may never even meet. We do an incredible job of loving the kids in this church and the kids in our community, but we're going to love out loud to kids that we may never ever meet. And that's what doing kingdom work is. And so we're going to pray and we're going to sing one more song. And as you go and enjoy your frosty, make your family a priority. When your children are begging you for Wendy's today, take them, right? But that's what we do because we love Jesus. And when we love him, our actions reflect that. And so let's pray and thank God that we have the ability to do this work together. Father God, thank you so much for not the have to, not the 
assignment, but the get to of going out and sharing your word. We're not just commanded, but we're invited to go out and to share the incredible things that you have done for us. So God, as we leave this place today, may we not go out to win an argument or to prove that we're right, but may we go out to point other people to you. May our lights shine so that people look at us and say, what is different about them? God, we thank you for this place. We thank you for the joy that comes from getting to worship you every single week. And we give you this last song as an act of worship to glorify you and to show the world that we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good week. We'll see you next time.